بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم قبل از اینکه برنامه رو شروع کنم برای شادی روح همه گذشتگان گذشتگان این جمع بالاخص مادر بزرگ حقیب که امروز در واقع دو سال میشه که ایشون به رحمت خدا رفتن رحم الله من یقرع الفاتحة مال اخلاص ما الصلوات أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأغدة من لساني يفقه قولي قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن هذا القرآن يهدي للتي هي أقوم ويبشر المؤمنين الذين يعملون الصالحات أن لهم أجرا كبيرا صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وآل محمد So normally I'm up here as a host so I'll do some host duties before I move on to speech duties We welcome you all to another night of the month of Ramadan at the Islamic Education Center I ask Sheikh Bahraini for permission to speak in English so that way I wouldn't have to do twice the amount of work to prepare portions of the lecture in Farsi because It's just a very, very hard language to uh, be able to speak up here properly. <laughs> so tonight, I'm kind of piggybacking off of Hajj Hassanin's speeches. Um, it's kind of tough to follow a speaker like that. Um, so what I did was I took one of the ayahs of the many ayahs that he spoke about in his uh, 10 nights here and decided to kind of go more in depth and see Are there certain secrets or patterns that you can extract from that ayah that would better explain the ayah? For those who don't know my background, um, I got my PhD from Maryland in electrical engineering and have since been focused in software engineering and pattern recognition. So part of my job is to write algorithms and computer programs that will mine uh, a lot of data that are produced across various industries. Right now we're focused in cancer. Uh, and the life sciences at the National Institutes of Health, um, where we come to try to identify biomolecules uh, from data that's collected off of patients to see if we can target uh, specific diseases and or treatments, uh, develop treatments for them better, or identify what the disease is actually doing to the person. So what I find interesting is often taking some of those techniques and uh, methods that we develop in software and seeing, well, If we were to look at the Qur'an in that same lens, what could be extracted? Is there some underlying hidden secret that uh, some of the ayahs are getting to us that if we were to extract and pull away some of the uh, structure of the Qur'an and strip it away, uh, you would actually start to see some uh, signal coming above some of the noise that's present uh, in the Qur'an. Now it's only noise because Often it's very difficult for uh, folks like us, particularly myself, that as we read the Qur'an to really understand it fully. And so um, it requires a certain methodology to be able to understand some of the principles and foundations um, so that we can identify what are root words, what are not root words, strip out some, some of the extra context, identify some of the missing things in the Qur'an, uh, so, At times, the Qur'an decides to leave certain words or verbs or context out and leaves it up to the listener or the reader to identify the proper context for it. Um, but there's a way to do that, right? And uh, the limited time I had with Sheikh Bahraini here a few years ago, where he would teach me every morning uh, some of the structure, we, would ba we barely touched the surface as far as I know, uh, to be able to kind of try and uncover some of the roots and pillars that come into uh, defining or translating, or for that matter, explaining some of the exegesis behind uh, the Holy Qur'an. So the ayah I chose for tonight that Hajj Hassanin focused on for the past few uh, nights, I think it was in the beginning of his lecture series rather than on the end, is the ayah from Surah Isra, ayah 9. إِنَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ يَهْدِي لِلَّتِي هِيَ أَقْوَمْ 
ويبشر المؤمنين الذين يعملون الصالحات أن لك أن لهم أجرا كبيرا. Then the ayah continues in the next ayah وأن الذين لا يؤمنون بالآخرة أعتدنا لهم عذابا أليما. So let's start to break down the ayah. We'll put it into these are two ayahs now, uh, but in the context of one, for some reason it's split into two. The reason we'll get into maybe tomorrow night, not tonight. But let's break down the foundation of the, these two ayahs and see what are the main pillars of these ayahs, and then we'll delve deep into one of the pillars uh, tonight and try to continue that um, through uh, the discussion tomorrow night. So it starts off really easily. Some, uh, some ayahs are very easy to understand, others are very complicated. This one's easy, thankfully. That's why I chose it. Inna hadha al Quran. Very easy. Right? Verily, this Quran. What's nice about this is that it starts with Adat al Taqid. So, normally, when something starts with Adat al Taqid, Allah SWT is trying to uh, begin the context from new, kind of doing a refresh on what he was discussing in the previous ayahs. There's still a link, but the link isn't as strong as if it was just like a Wahad al Quran, for example. Right? So, in other words, he was discussing something in a previous ayah. And now he's uh, uh, going to continue the discussion with a direct link. In this case, there is a link, uh, but the link is, is not as direct, if you will. Second, Hada al Quran. Hada is a word that you use to point to something that is very nearby. So it's unlike Surah Baghara, where you read, Dalika al Kitab la Raibafi. Right? The word Dalika there, referring to the book that is mentioned in Surah Baghara is pointing to something that is really far away, very difficult to grasp, very difficult to maintain or understand. In this case, he flips the discussion. He makes it simple. He says, Hada al-Qur'an. So now we have no doubt that the Qur'an he's talking about is this one, the one that we're reading, inshallah, these nights of Ramadan, the one that was brought forth uh, uh, in this month. So now we've established what we're talking about. We're going to be talking about this Qur'an. If you look at parts of the way Allah describes the Qur'an, sometimes it gets confusing in the way that some of the adjectives or, or words he uses to describe it. For example, in Surah Yasin, you have Yasin wal Qur'an al-Hakim. Al-Hakim is normally not used for something that's not living, for something that's not, uh, that doesn't have some kind of life. You don't often call a book, at least not in English, Al-Hakim. You don't call a book wise. You call a person wise. You call a teacher, a mentor wise. Currently, you don't call the President of the United States wise. But you do call individuals, things that live, wise. You call a decision wise. Because that decision could have existing ramifications. But a book is not often referred to as wise. Unless it has some kind of living context. So if you look in Surah Baqarah, the same place where he discusses this Qur'an, uh, in multiple places, in the first, in the second ayah, it's ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهِ هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ He uses the word hudan here as an object. So he's not really giving it a sense of life with this ayah. It's a, it's a guiding-like principle. It's hudan لِلْمُتَّقِينَ So it's an object talking to an object. The Qur'an is an object. Qudan here is referring to the object that the Qur'an is for the muttaqi. Or if you look in Surah, again in Surah Baqarah, the ayah we all know and love in, 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 uh, uh, about the month of Ramadan, شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان Again, the word hudan here is brought as an object. It's not brought as a uh, as, as a adjective or a verb uh, in a sense where this thing has life. It describes this thing that is good for you. It's like a pill. Take it. It's worth it. In this ayah, there's only two ayahs in the Quran. One is this one, and I didn't write the second one. I knew I should have. I probably have it here somewhere. We'll find it when we go. Oh no, I found it. Surah Jinn. There's only two verses in the Quran that uses this word hudan, hadiyah, guidance, in verb form in the present tense. 
associated with the Quran. The first one is here in Surah Isra. Inna hadha al-Qur'an yahdi lillati hiya aqwa. It brings a continuous present verb, a, a present tense verb that's, that signifies continuity in its translation. I'm like, why? This is one of those times where the Qur'an tries to make a claim that it is a living thing when at other times it just describes it as an object. If you look in 74 mentions of a present tense conjugation of the word huda, 72 times it's about Allah SWT. Only two times in the Quran does yahdi, the word huda in its present tense, which means it guides, it's constantly and presently guiding you, does it show up with the Qur'an? The first one is here in Surah Isra. The second one is in Surah Jinn, which is interesting. Pull it up. I think I saved it. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah SWT starts, A'udhu Billahi Min Ash-Shaytan Ar-Rajim, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Qul Uhiya Ilayya Annahu Stama'a Nafarun Min Al-Jinn, Faqalu Inna Sami'na Qur'anan Ajaba, Yahdi Ila Ar-Rushd, Fa'amanna Bih, Walan Nushrika Bi Rabbina Ahada. In this case, the word Qur'an though is brought slightly differently from the way it's brought in Surah Isra. In Surah Isra, there's no doubt that the Qur'an that we're referring to is Hadha al-Qur'an. In Surah Jinn, there's different tapasi. There's different interpretations because it's not brought as clearly as Surah Isra. In Surah Jinn, it comes and says, Qur'anan ajaba. This could be something general that they heard through qara'a. Somebody was reading something and they heard it. Or, most of the tafasir point to this Qur'an and to the Qur'an that we know and love. This one right here. So, the Qur'an is now here. We have for at least one group of individuals. You notice in Surah Isra, it leaves it blank. It doesn't say who it's here for. To do this constant act of guidance. But in Surah Jinn, it's very specific. It comes and says, the Jinn heard it. They were surprised, and when they were surprised, they came and realized that this Qur'an was Yahdi ila rush. It was for their own elevation. And once they realized that, immediately, fa'amanna bih. The fa here, from what I saw in the tafasir, comes and refers to, it happens immediately. It's a sudden thing of time. Toshenidan, they did this. They began to believe in the holy book that is the Quran. And from this, they did not, uh, uh, from this, they no longer put did shirk to, to their Lord. In Surah Asra, it leaves a blank. Surah Asra doesn't come and tell us who is this Quran guiding. What is this continuous action of guidance that the Qur'an is doing? So it leaves multiple gaps. It just ends it right there. إِنَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ يَهْدِي لِلَّتِي هِيَ أَقْوَى And it stops at that part of the ayah. So let's break down the rest of the ayah, then we'll come back and I'll focus only on this part tonight. What is the second thing the Qur'an does? وَيُبَشِّرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ الصَّالِحَاتِ that's the second thing it does. The second thing this Qur'an actively does, again, you notice it's brought in a present tense verb. It comes and gives 
great tidings to the mu'minin, ya'maluna the ones who do the good actions, anna lahum, that for them, ajran kabira, is a huge grand reward. And again, it stops. It doesn't say in this ayah what that reward is, when you get it, when you don't get it, do I have to really wait all the way until the next life to get this reward? Can't I cash out my investment in this world? Is there a way to do that? How can I do it? Then it has a third action that it does. But it doesn't bring this one in the form of an action. It just continues from the previous one, which means it leaves out the action. The Quran purposely drops a word. وَأَنَّ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ أَعْتَدْنَا لَهُمْ عَذَابًا أَلِيمًا So it brings an exact symmetric match to what it said about the mu'mineen. While it's giving great tidings to the mu'mineen about أَجْرًا kabira, at the same time, it does something, we don't know what, it's not clear here. وَأَنَّ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ أَعْتَدْنَا لَهُمْ عَذَابًا أَلِيمًا It brings to them عَذَابًا أَلِيمًا So that's simple. Nice. Right? Easy peasy. That's why, this, that's why I chose this ayah. Nice structure. Easy breakdown. And now what we'll do is we'll hop into that first part. So the three parts were the three actions that the Qur'an does يَهْدِي لِلَّتِي هُوَ أَقْوَمْ هِيَ أَقْوَمْ وَيُبَشِّرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And it does something which we don't know. وَأَنَّ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ So these three things it does. So let's hop into the first one. And while we're hopping in detail into these different breakdowns of the ayahs, let's also take away that, remember the original context of the selection of this ayah, aside from it being easy. The Qur'an is using a present tense verb here to show life to show some level of continuity, to show some level of consistence, of something happening over time. It's giving the Qur'an some sort of life. And so with anything that has life, if there is a good lesson to be learned from that thing that has life, we should learn it too. So not only should we take away the specifics of what the Qur'an's responsibilities are, but also look and see how does the Qur'an address the responsibilities it has and try and see if we can incorporate those responsibilities the way the Qur'an addresses it in our own lives. Because we have a set of responsibilities that we have to adhere to as well. And there's a certain way for us to adhere to those responsibilities. Well, why not look and see how this living thing that is the Qur'an adheres to its responsibilities and we can take lessons from the same way. So let's hop into the first one. Yahdi lillati hiya aqwa. So the first lesson you take away is again, I'm going to jump on the word yahdi. It does something continuously. It does something consistently. It does something that requires a, if I do step A, then I do step B, then I have to do step C, then I have to do step D, and it doesn't end at step Z. After step Z, like a typewriter, you restart, and you start from A prime, you go all the way to Z prime, you restart again. A, this thing has to be continuous. In the other times where we talked about the Qur'an being hudan, there was no sense of consistency. This could have been an, an object, right? The rock is black. And that's it, the rock is black. Sure, the rock could be black over time. At some point, it could stop being black. Somebody could come and color it. Somebody could come and change something. So there's, there's this objectifying of, of, uh, in other places of the Quran. But in this case, it's not an objectification. In this case, it's talking about a living thing that is continuously acting on something. It's continuously doing this act of hedai. So the analogy that I bring here is that when people go to the gym, you can't start bench pressing heavy weights on day one. You have to consistently build up to it. If you want to go on a diet, as many people in my family often do, but for some reason it doesn't work. 
You can't just decide to stop eating tomorrow. You have to slowly bring down what you're eating, then start to find a substitution, then slowly bring it up. It takes time. If you go to do a sudden action, you'll notice you're going to do more harm than you do good. In math, we call this an impulse response. It's like taking a hammer. You notice only Karate Kid could take a nail and hit with one shot and get that nail in immediately. The rest of us, you take the nail with a hammer and you slowly hit until you're sure the nail is in, and then you hit it. And then you pick up the next nail, and you do the same thing. Then you pick up the next nail, and you do the same thing. So it's this continuous action to build a structure or a foundation. What is the structure and foundation that it's building? Hedayah. It's building the structure and action of Hedayat. What kind of Hedayat? The ayah says, Lilati hiya aqwam. The best kind. The aqwam here is barvazna af'alu tafsi, which means it's the most straight, strong, clear, whatever English word you, you want to use. As maddeya qiyam So soft harib. Not yeah, soft as in Farsi soft, not soft as in English soft. It has the most clear of paths defined to it. And so the first lesson as an individual you can take away is the continuity. The second thing you can take away is that to do this, to build lilati hiya aqwa, it had to know its principles. It had to be able to make itself aqwam. So that way it could come and do yahdi to others for lillati hiya aqwam. So for all those who are looking to understand what is the purpose of going to school, you're never going to use the lessons that you learned in school again in your classes at work, the answer is, well, that's pretty true. But what school gives you that nothing else can't give you is this continuous building and identifying of what you want to do for the remaining part of your life. You may not use the exact course that you took back in school at your job. I have colleagues now who were working in, like I said, genetics and, and protein analysis and protein design. Their backgrounds are in finance. Their backgrounds are in accounting. If you ask this person when he was in accounting or in finance or studying history or political science, do you think one day you could get a job to design novel proteins or identify the cause of a disease? You'd say, no, I'm not studying that. That doesn't make any sense. Why would I ever get a job that has to do with genetic disorders? Because I'm studying finance. You start to see the skill set that same individual starts to gain while he or she is in school, and you start to see they develop an aptitude for math and programming. Those skills, while applied to finance or political science or history or whatever have you, can also be applied in other domains, and that's what they become good at. And so what are they going to do? They're going to take the principles and things that they learned from school and bring those over to a new domain. And that's where you get revolutions to occur. That's where you get the real innovations come. When somebody who is not trained in a specific subject brings the skill set that they have from a completely tangential domain and applies it here, that's how you got the first launches to space. That's how you got the iPhone. Steve Jobs was not, Haj Hassanin brought him as an example. They didn't know anything about electronics. Nothing. He didn't even get his degree. He was good at design and art. What he brought to the table was how can I make the breadboard that goes inside these phones look pretty? And by doing that, he was able to miniaturize the electronics required 
and the space that they take on these circuit boards. And when you do that, well, now you can have more functionality on a chip. And when you do that, you can now provide the phone with more capabilities. And so you can provide the same phone with the access to the internet to make phone calls and to communicate and to text and email and do everything else you want. That's what the Quran is doing. The Quran is coming and showing that first, I need to game that skill set. And what's that skill set? In what domain? If you look in Surah Zomar, it comes and says what domain it's going to come and describe its specific skill sets in. وَلَقَدْ ذَرَبْنَا لِلنَّاسِ فِي هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ مِنْ كُلِّ مَثَلٍ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَذَكَّرُ So that helped. It brings examples and lessons from every single domain. Every single one. Whether it's finance, you can go look at the laws of Khoms and Ers. Whether it's social life, you can go look at all the examples it brings of the surahs of, of Prophet Musa and Prophet Yusuf. Whether it's politics, again, you can refer to those surahs. Whether it's religion, you can come and see it says, believe in this, don't believe in this, expect this. Whether it's science, you can come and see how it describes nature and the planets and the, and the solar system and the galaxies. It has everything. Everything. And so it was able to build itself up in a way where now, consistently it can do, Yahdi lillati hiya aqub. A verb that was always and only 72 times referred to as the only being that could do this is Allah SWT. Either do it or not do it. Wallahu la yahdi al qawm al is not doing it. Wallahu yahdi man yasha is for whenever he wants to do it. So that's the first part. That's literally everything you can get from the word here, yahdi. Consistency, what? The only thing we didn't discuss so far, and we'll use the last 10 minutes of the discussion to discuss tonight is the how. How does it decide to do it? How does the Qur'an come to try to do this consistent hidayat, this continuous hidayat? And for that, we'll hop into one last ayah, and as I find it, please send us salawat. Surah Ala Imran. It's probably my favorite ayah, and it's why I do what I do in the Quran, or one of my favorites. Where'd it go? So much for being favorite, I lost it. There it is. Who a levy Anzala alay kal kitaba Minho ayatun muhkamat Hunna umul kitab Wa ukharu mutashabiha. This is how the Qur'an does it. It has two types of ayahs. It has two ways to do this kind of continuous guidance. The first is through ayatum muhkam. The first is through the solid, clear, concrete, uh, uh, understandable, direct ayahs. Such as, how do I pay home? On what? Such as, how do I give inheritance? Such as, is pig haram? Very clear, very direct, very concrete. There's no, ah, oh, but what about this? Oh, but about what that? Oh, what if this situation happened? What if that situation happened? None of that. Very clear, very direct. Hunna ummul kitab. This is the bulk of the book. This is the, this is the core. This is what the Qur'an tries to uh, ensure it gets across clearly. But if anybody 
has done anything in sales ever in their lives. At the end of the day, this religion has to be sold to individuals, right? For them to believe that it's the right one and join it. Or adhere to certain principles of it or respect it. There is a quote-unquote sales job there that needs to be done. How many times have you guys gone to a car dealer or gone to a bank or gone anywhere who somebody is trying to sell you something or do something for you and as soon as you sit down on the other side of the table, they'll come and tell you exactly what they're up to. And they'll come and say, okay, I want to sell this car to you for this much and that's it. That's all I want. Take it or leave it. They would never make a sale. It would never happen. We have a, a rule in, in our company that is if we haven't heard about the direct requests indirectly before the manager brings out the requests directly, we've already lost. And the tongue twister. There. So basically, if we're going to bid on a proposal that we haven't heard about before the direct call for proposals, We've already lost. We have to have heard whether I want to publish a paper, whether I want to join a school, whether I want to get into a program, whether I want a job. You have to have heard about the job opening, about the person who is hiring, about the company that's hiring, before you even submit your application. Otherwise, it won't even be looked at. It'll go into, I mean, all of us have done it, right? You've sent resumes around. Most of us have probably done it. You've sent resumes around, and they just get in a stockpile. If you went around the room and you said, Where, how was the last time you got a job? I bet 9 out of 10 people in the room would say, through a referral. Somebody referred me to this guy. He knew this person, and somehow, everything at the end of the day is, uh, uh, you know, this kind of informality. You have to know somebody, you have to know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. I think the only word in Farsi for this is partibas. It's true. You won't be able to find a job or get into a program, on, or the chances of you getting in is much lower if you're just submitting an application cold. So there has to be some level of indirect conversation. There has to be some level of not telling me exactly what's needed, but shaping the way I think so that way when I get your application and I read the words that are on your application, when you say network, I know you mean computer network and not social network. If you hadn't had the conversation with me beforehand, it would be difficult for me to catch that if I'm looking at a thousand resumes and I'm flipping through them real quickly. If somebody gets a thousand resumes, you're going to spend one minute, barely, per resume. Just going to take a look at the keywords and toss it to the next one. And if that person, you don't know them, the chance of you reaching back out to them is pretty low. If somebody refers them to you, great. So Quran does muhkam, and then Quran, and that's the bulk of it, that's the most direct part, because you can't have a wishy-washy foundation. You have to have a core. And then from there, it'll bring mutashabih. It'll bring analogies. It'll bring syllogisms. It'll bring flexibility. And that's what allows the Qur'an to not be confined by space and time. A ruling now, I remember with, in, in class with Sheikh Bahraini, I think the hardest thing for me to understand was that there is no such thing in Islam except for the muhkam cases as black and white. Even when something is halal or haram, that thing that is halal or haram, most of the time, can change depending on where you are and the time that you're in. There are things now that are halal that used to be haram years ago, decades ago, centuries ago. The religion can't change. The religion didn't change. The principle of that which was haram is still haram. But the context changed. The easiest one is, is eating 
the flesh of a dead animal that wasn't killed the right way, haram, all the time. In every scenario. And immediately everybody will answer no. I hope. Otherwise, I'm going to have a lot of conversations when I walk off the podium. In the extreme case that you're starving and there is no food available, what happens? Same thing with wudu. Can you do salat if you don't have wudu? No, you can't. Unless something has occurred that now changes the, ad the application or, or, or adaptation of that rule. The, the ruk for namaz before you enter in is tahara. Wudu helps make you tahir in a certain ritualistic sense. If you can't make wudu, the ruk now is tayam. That will make you tahir so you can go into namaz. But you said you can't do wudu without, you can't do prayer without wudu. And says, well, it depends. And that's the beauty of Islam. Those are the simple ones. There are other ones that I don't want to go open Pandora's box here. Of certain rulings that under certain conditions and times and places are, can be practiced differently. There is a gray area, a very, very gray area. The part of the Qur'an that emphasizes on the gray area is the ayahs that are mutashabih. And the Qur'an uses these two words sometimes in different ways. We're only going to focus on these two because it's the one that's most directly relevant to the discussion. So what does it mean to be mutashabih? What does it mean to be mutashabih? Mutashabih in English literally means similar. As soon as you just say something similar, in math, you now have multiple things that you have to define. You can't just say, I'm similar. You, or you can't just say similar. There has to be an object one. There has to be an object two. There has to be a comparison of object one to object two in a certain way that you define similarity. Because that is so flexible, I have a job today. You can define any kind of similarity metric that you want. It has to adhere and apply to certain conditions. But the sky's the limit. There are people who have theorems named after them because they have custom similarity metrics defined for them. Similarity metrics on real number space is the Cartesian coordinate system. Similarities in probability space is called black Leibler divergences. And there's multiple ways to measure distances and similarities between points. Many, many, many ways. My research, day to day, what I do when I'm not here, which is not most of the time, is that. Focusing on identifying the appropriate application of a similarity function that will compare point A to point B so that I can get something meaningful out of the comparison of point A and point B. So how does the Qur'an have us do it? Again, we're back in Surah Ala Imran, and I'll wrap up. I'm starting to see yawns, that means people are tired. So here's what's nice. Before it describes how it does similarities, it addresses a specific risk. There is a problem with leaving things fuzzy. There is a problem with leaving a gray area. And what's the problem with leaving things in a gray area? It's that twofold. The one, Qur'an mentions directly. Second, the Qur'an doesn't mention here, but we see it in practice all the time, particularly in our community. The one that the Qur'an mentions here, which probably happens in our community too, is those who are, want to cause fitna, those who want to cause issues in a community, in an organization, in a religion. They will jump on these ayahs that are mutashabih, and they'll come and say, see, the Qur'an says this, 
and he's not applying it in this way. I remember there were multiple times here where we got to experience that personally. You jump on a specific interpretation of an ayah that doesn't match the whole split, the political split in Islam between Shia and Sunni at the highest level is because of an incorrect application of a rule. Do we elect in Islam or do we select? The answer is, well, we do both. But we have to do them under certain times, under certain conditions. They can be applied in certain ways. So now, how do we go and define this similarity? And in the ending of this ayah, Allah brings it. وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَأْوِيلَهُ And nobody knows the true interpretation of these ayahs that are mutashabih except for Allah وَالرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ And the people who are upright in knowledge. You look through as many tafasir as you want. وَالرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ is none other than Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and his family. Salawat ala Muhammad. That's it. It's that simple. وَمَا يَذَّكَّرُ إِلَّا أُلُوا الْأَلْبَعَ Sorry. Those two people, يَقُولُونَ آمَنَّ بِهِ كُلٌّ مِّنْ عِنْدِ رَبِّنَا وَمَا يَذَّكَّرُ إِلَّا أُلُوا الْأَلْبَعَ that's simple. The people who now adhere to these, this comparison has the knowledge to be able to respond to uh, uh, what is a mutashabih. They were the only ones who will have complete interpretation. If you look at the shan and uzul of this ayah, it has two potential ones. One is that a group of Jews came to the Prophet and were banging on huruf muqatta'at and this ayah came down because they were focusing on one or two specific huruf muqatta'at that led to some weird conclusion about the religion and the second one was about uh, when a group of Christians came to the Prophet and started to uh, 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 harp on what is this ruh in the Quran is that not Jesus so these are the two shan and uzul I don't know which one's right you can go ask uh, so we'll end on this note we have the last two minutes we started with the first ayah which was the main focus in Surah Isra inna hadha al-Quran yahdi lillati hiya aqwam wa yubashiru al-mu'minin al-lazina ya'amaluna al-salihat anna lahum ajran kabira wa anna al-lazina la yu'minuna bil-akhira atatna lahum adaban alima we saw that it had a verb used in a present tense, which shows continuity. We talked about what it tries to discuss, and the answer was everything. It has lessons in everything. How does it do it? It does it with ayatul muhkam, and it does it with ayatul mutashabih. Tomorrow we'll pick up the discussion on what are appropriate ayatul mutashabih, why even have ayat mutashabih we didn't talk about that we only talked about Quran brings a risk it doesn't talk about the benefit in this ayat in surah al Imran. it only talks about the risk and then we talked about how it does the comparison only with Allah through the rest of this book rasakhuna fil ilm and then those that want to adhere to those principles. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us during this month. Inshallah. Amoz ruza ayah hana ye qawul bashi inshallah. Allahumma rabba shahr ramadan. Alladhi anzalta fihi al-Qur'an.